Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Device Pilot webinar on AWS IoT. I'm going to introduce myself in a moment, uh, and then I want to give you just a couple of slides of context about the Internet of Things in general before I go on and talk about these new IoT services from AWS. Then I'd like to talk about some of the challenges you might be thinking about in architecting and designing your IoT solution. Then I'll try and paint a picture of what the emerging stack of IoT technologies are and where these AWS pieces fit within that. Then we'll have time for Q&A. So if you've got any questions now or as I'm speaking, please type them into the chat window so that we can address them in a timely way when the time comes. And then I'll finish off with a few resources for further reading. So to introduce myself, I'm a computer scientist originally, and more recently, I've started several technology companies. AlertMe was the first company to create uh, a um, national um, smart home platform, which is now known as Hive in the UK. And I'm currently running Device Pilot, which is a company providing service assurance for companies connecting their products. So to give you a little bit of uh, context here, about IoT in general. In terms of business trends, we definitely see a trend in the world in general from products to services. So companies used to sell products in a one-off way, and now they're trying to move towards a, a mode of recurring revenue. Companies that provide recurring revenue are generally valued much more highly than ones that sell one-off products, which tend to become commodities. And obviously IoT has a big role to play in that because often it's hard to turn a product into a service without connecting it so you can measure its use and continually improve the service. Another trend, which is partly business and partly technology, is that, say, 10 years ago, when people were doing connected products, they tended to have to build everything themselves, and they ended up with a vertical, a vertical silo, vertically integrated silo. So they would build their own products, their own devices, um, build, the, build their own platform, build their own applications. And they did that because they couldn't get the pieces from anyone else. Um, and the net result was that their solution didn't work very well with others. Now we're getting into the ecosystem phase of the IoT. And in that case, it's possible to build your solution largely out of off-the-shelf pieces. Uh, and the result is that you often develop your proposition in partnership with other people. And together, you work to grow the market. So a good example that we're all familiar with is something like uh, Alexa, for example, from Amazon. Uh, which is inherently an ecosystem. Alexa would be really pretty useless if it didn't integrate with all of the other connected thing, things in your life. There are also some technology trends going on in IoT. One is definitely uh, homogenization. So several years ago, there were many, many different edge standards for connecting devices like Zigbee, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. Uh, and there were many different IoT platforms. There were more than 300 IoT platforms that claimed to provide all the pieces you need to connect your product and deliver a, deliver a service. Um, and well, there still are lots of edge standards and there still are lots of IoT platforms. But in truth, a lot of consolidation has happened. And now most of those edge standards are connected to the cloud using the, the internet and web protocols that we're all familiar with, which makes it very easy to use multiple applications with multiple devices without worrying about standards interoperability. And although there are still lots of IoT platforms, some clear winners are emerging. So a device pilot, we, we find that about half of our customers, or perhaps slightly more, uh, are either using or are planning to use AWS. Uh, followed by probably Azure as a strong second, and, and then some other platforms behind that. But that homogenization means that if two companies implement their solutions, they're quite likely by chance to actually end up on the same platform. And that obviously makes interoperability much, much easier. The other big trend in technology that's happening is um, to do with the move of servers from on-premise, something that used to sit under your desk, to the cloud where uh, servers ran on technologies such as EC2 inside Amazon. And that was an advance because it meant that you no longer had to physically buy and pay for your servers. And you could very quickly buy more servers if you needed to scale up. But you still had quite a lot of operational overhead because those servers could run out of disk space. You could run out of RAM and need to move to larger servers. Um, and uh, things crashed in various ways. So there's still quite a lot of operational load. So the latest trend is to move to what's called serverless. And here, it's possible to define very small pieces of application code that may, may just be a few lines of code, uh, sometimes known as lambdas. 
And these run on demand when certain things happen. So for example, if some um, data arrives on the edge of the cloud, a Lambda may be triggered, which then does something with that data, maybe stores it to disk. And the advantage of Lambdas is you don't have to think at all about the servers that they're running on. So you might need one Lambda, or you might suddenly need a 1,000 Lambdas, and the infrastructure will just gear up to do that. So no longer do you need to worry about all the operational overhead of running out of disk space at, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Another piece of IoT context I wanted to share is that people often imagine when they get into IoT for the first time that the, the expenditure picture is going to look a bit like this, that there'll be a big development um, mountain hurdle that they have to overcome. They have to build their product uh, and their, choose a platform, build their application, get it into the hands of users, refine the proposition. Once they're over that hurdle, they'll then um, be able to just scale. And of course, what they find is that once they get over that hurdle, there's actually a different problem starts to rear its head, which actually can be far more expensive as they scale, which is the whole operational challenge. Connected products are complicated. There are many different moving parts which can go wrong. And it's operations job to keep all those pieces working sweetly. So I think it's really important when you think about IoT to not just think about the, the upfront development cost and, and effort, but also the ongoing costs, which tend to grow in proportion to your number of devices, which, which of course in many IoT applications is a lot of devices. So with that context out of the way, let's dive right into the meat of, of this webinar, which is really just introducing these new services from AWS. There's something called IoT Core, or at least it's called IoT Core now, but this is what AWS has been offering for several years. And these are really the core functions that every single connected product needs. The first thing is a, a device gateway, which sits on the edge of the cloud. It allows devices to post data into the cloud and allows applications to subscribe to that data and do things with it. So it provides some isolation between the devices and the application. It provides a shadow, which deals with the fact that many IoT devices are not awake a lot of the time. If they're battery powered, then they'll be asleep a lot of the time. Often their connect connectivity isn't very good. And so, if, for example, an application wants to read something from a device, like find out its temperature, the device might not be awake to answer that question. So the, the device shadow actually sits there caching that information um, so that it can say, well, the last known temperature was an hour ago and it was 53 degrees centigrade. It can also deal with um, storing commands that have been sent from the application to the device uh, and it'll forward them onto the device when the device wakes up. And the other thing that IoT Core uh, deals with is security. So it deals with the issuing and management of certificates and the authentication and authorization of devices at the edge of the cloud. So those are the three kind of key um, features and functions which everyone needs dealt with by IoT Core. Now, IoT device management is one of the newer services which AWS announced just before Christmas. And this is really a layer on top of IoT Core that lets you define and then trigger specific device jobs. So for example, these could be upgrading Upgrading the firmware in your device would be a classic case. And now you can define these and manage them uh, in a uniform way. IoT Analytics is something else that um, AWS announced before Christmas. It's not actually publicly available yet, but essentially it allows you to define um, ongoing streaming queries on the incoming data from your devices, which can do things like data reduction or uh, spotting certain conditions that have happened on your device and triggering certain reactions. Now, an important aspect of all of these things is that they're serverless. So you don't have to think, well, how many servers am I going to have to cope with my load uh, and so on. It all just scales automatically and transparently. On the device side of things, there are a couple of uh, new innovations. One is Greengrass, which Amazon launched a little while ago. I don't think it's widely used yet, but it's a very interesting idea. And I think over time, it will gain traction. And this is the idea that lambdas, these tiny little snippets of code that can run in response to something, can actually be moved from the cloud out to your edge device, your IoT device, without knowing that they've moved. And that's obviously very attractive because it allows you to write your code once and run it anywhere. This is part of the phenomenon of edge computing. And um, uh, you know, it, it's obviously interesting if, you're, uh, if you've got a, um, uh, an unreliable connection between your device and the cloud, um, or you've got some very compute intensive um, task. The nice thing about running things at the edge is that the um, compute resource actually grows in tandem with your, um, uh, with your need. So if you get 10 times as many customers, you also get 10 times as much compute resource to, to do whatever that function is. 
The other new piece that Amazon announced recently is that they've acquired the company um, that built free RTOS. Now, an RTOS is the, the kernel or the real-time operating system that exists on very lightweight IoT devices. So these are things that are much smaller than a, a Linux box, a gateway box. These are the things that you might use for doing temperature sensing. They might have to have a 10-year battery life. They have to be extremely power efficient. Um, they have small memories and so on. And uh, so an RTOS sits there uh, managing multiple applications and so on. Free RTOS is, a, is one of the many uh, common uh, open source choices of RTOS that are out there. So what Amazon have done is they've actually changed the terms of the license of that so that it's now truly open source uh, under the uh, MIT license, so you can use it for any purpose. And they're also setting about making it very easy to use free RTOS with the AWS IoT services. So now let's just think about some of the challenges you might be considering as you, as you choose your technologies and choose your architectures. One thing you might be worried about is lock-in. If I, if I use some third-party service, am I going to end up locked into it and maybe uh, the vendor will uh, stop supporting it very well or change their prices or go out of business? Uh, obviously, that kind of thing can be, can be a risk. Another thing you'll be thinking about is time to market. IoT typically is developed and launched and iterated in a period of months rather than years. It's the speed of, of commerce today generally. And so obviously, if you can get up and running really quickly and iterate quickly, that's a massive competitive advantage. The third thing to think about is scaling. We all like scaling to just happen. It never does. It always requires work and, and your architecture will have to change as you grow through the orders of magnitude from thousands of devices to millions. But as far as possible, we'd like not to have to keep throwing away our architecture and our code every time we, we grow by an order of magnitude. So we'd like a relatively elastically scaling uh, solution. The fourth thing, which is sort of the flip side of scaling, is quality. So the reason it's the flip side is it's very hard to get scaling without quality, and it's also hard to get quality without scaling. So if you have 100 devices and you have a 1% problem, then you have one unhappy customer. If you have 100,000 devices with a 1% problem, then you've got 1,000 unhappy customers, and that's clearly not tenable. So as you scale, your quality needs to get better. But the good news is that as you scale, your quality can get better because improving your quality requires investment. And so it's an economy of scale type of thing. So um, as you have more customers, you can afford more investment in quality. And the fifth thing, obviously, is cost. And as we've just talked about, it's not just development cost, but it's your ongoing operations cost and how to minimize that. So if we just think about how AWS uh, scores in these domains, I think it does pretty well. Now, obviously, any service would like you to carry on using it. And there is obviously some degree of investment in understanding um, the, the terms and techniques and tools that work with any cloud service. And you know that's true for AWS as it is for Azure and so on. I think what, what AWS does have a good track record of, though, is not uh, retiring its services. It's introduced a lot of services. It's gone on um, supporting them for a long time. Uh, and so you know, it's got a good track record of, of not surprising its customers in that regard. And in terms of the other parameters, I think like any cloud service, AWS allows you extremely rapid time to market. Uh, you can deploy literally in, in days. Um, in terms of scaling, because it's elastic and serverless, it does make scaling very easy, although you will still have to make adjustments as you grow. Uh, quality, of course, AWS has the economies of scale. It has very large numbers of customers, and therefore it can invest very highly in quality. And, and the same is true, really, from a cost perspective. So finally, I wanted to finish by just trying to paint a bit of a picture of um, where some of these pieces fit within the canonical IoT stack, which is starting to become uh, clear. So if we start off and just think about um, the, the piece of AWS IoT that's existed for several years, which is what most people uh, use, we've got the application sitting in the cloud that's written by you. That subscribes to IoT Core, which in turn receives messages from your device that, that are sent from the application that's running within your device. And in some cases, that could be as simple as almost one line of code, which is reading uh, a temperature sensor and, and transmitting that into the cloud. 
Obviously, the fact that you're running within a cloud allows you access to all the vast number of, of services that AWS now has available. I, I think there's probably more than 100 today. Um, the particularly relevant ones are Lambdas, which we've talked about, Kinesis, which is a queuing mechanism. Uh, there are many different databases available as a service. And underpinning all of that, of course, there's EC2, which lets you uh, stand up any, any unusual code that's not available as a service. Um, so you can run anything you could run on your own servers or your own your own uh, laptop even uh, in the cloud. And uh, of course, S3, which is an extremely uh, available, resilient and low cost storage mechanism. One of the interesting things about S3 is that it's always been um, low cost and highly available. But what's starting to happen now is that some of these uh, cloud components have actually got extremely high bandwidth access to S3. So for example, if thousands of lambdas need to fire up and pull data out of an S3 bucket, uh, then, then they can do that. And, and so you almost start to get the best of both worlds in terms of uh, cost and performance. If we look at some of these other new pieces that have come recently from AWS IoT, We've got uh, the device manager. This is obviously sitting at a level higher than IoT Core because it uses concepts defined in IoT Core. But it's underneath the application because it's something the application might trigger in order, for example, to start an upgrade. Meanwhile, on the device, we've got FreeRTOS now sitting underneath the application, providing a bit of um, commonality and rep replicability underneath the application. And we've also got Greengrass potentially, if it's a high-end IoT device, um, sitting there, allowing you to move your lambdas to the edge for edge compute. And of course, I, I, I wouldn't be complete if I didn't say uh, that there are many, many other services and many, many other pieces you'll need to deliver your complete solution. You'll need a billing solution. You'll need a customer support solution. And of course, the piece that Device Pilot offers, which is service assurance. So as the application faces your end users, so service assurance faces your own operations team and lets them see what's going on with all your devices and whether you're delivering to a high quality. So we've got to the point where we're going to ask whether there are any questions. And um, I think we've received a few questions. Um, we've actually got our lead developer, Tom, who's actually now going to hopefully come on stage uh, and see if he can answer them. Tom, are you with us? There we go. I think I've joined you. Hi, my name is Tom, as uh, Perkins says. Uh, I'm a developer here at Device Pilot, and I've been uh, working a lot with AWS IoT, so hopefully I'll be able to answer people's questions. Uh, now I can see uh, Steve's question uh, about firmware updates and how they're dealt with the AWS IoT service. Uh, the answer there is it depends how deeply you've uh, entered the AWS ecosystem. If you're using the free R2OS uh, real-time operating system with Greengrass, which is a local edge device, then you can get fully managed AWS firmware updates, which take you from code signing to the OTA protocol. And actually that manages even sending to the devices using MQTT, I believe, and small packages, making sure you know, MD hashing on the other side to make sure that it's the right version uh, and then restarting the device to apply the update. Uh, if you haven't invested quite as much, uh, the sort of second tier solution is to use the uh, messaging protocols that are AWS IoT go to send, uh, to, to execute a job on your devices, which will send a message telling your device to update and typically the location of maybe an S3 bucket where you can find the firmware image. And then it's up to you to undertake that update and update your operating system as you require, put the code changes in place, verify them, restart your device, and then get back to AWS IoT to say that it went successfully. Uh, underneath that protocol, there's the ability to do uh, to report progress. Yeah and react to failure. So if you're not using the full free R2S uh, stack, there are opportunities higher up. Sorry, that was from uh, uh, Steve. Uh, the uh, next one, which is how easy is it to manage the uh, IoT device firmware software updates? Uh, 
Yes, effectively, uh, these job, so the IoT job, Q jobs can work on device groups and it has a notion of continuous jobs. So for example, if you're running out with uh, zero firmware and all devices, so if you're selling all your devices with version zero firmware, when they're first turned on, you can have it so that all of your devices that match having zero firmware are immediately notified that there are firmware uh, upgrades and they'll automatically upgrade. Uh, and finally, Chris, yes, I have had a chance to try S3 Select. Um, frustratingly, I'm not really allowed to talk about it because it's an NTA with AWS. How does it compare to running lambdas across the S3? However, I can answer that uh, directly because it's in their open thing. S3 Select will allow you, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, to use SQL statements to select what you want to take off your files or objects in the S3 bucket. The advantage of this is that probably the slowest thing in the whole ecosystem is actually transferring data from A to B. So if you only need a partial amount of the data, then S3 Select will be faster than downloading it all into a Lambda and then selecting the data you need. Of course, if you needed all of that data to process that, then S3 Select gives you no advantage. Uh, AWS has uh, come up with a pretty cool map reduce example where they were effectively not using every rose. And I believe they said they had a speed increase of about uh, 14, 14 fold speed increase, but we can, uh, as I said, it depends on how much of the file you need. If you need all the file, then it's not going to help you. Uh, so next up is Steve again. Uh, can the AWS IoT service be used with any protocols other than MQTT and HTTPS? Uh, yes and no. HTTPS, actually, if you will wrap a WebSocket which connects to the MQTT protocol. So if you don't support MQTT, but you can attach to a WebSocket, then in a way you can get through with their WebSockets. The slightly more complicated answer is that Greengrass has what I believe is an open source wrapper for the OPC UA protocol, which I know is used in a lot of industrial IoT settings. Uh, that allows OPC UA devices to talk to the Greengrass, i.e. the edge device. But have a look at the GitLab, uh, GitHub project. Effectively, all that does is take OPC commands and switch them into MQTT. So although yes, with an edge device, you can do it. And there's a project out there that gives you a sort of implementation. It, it's not really native. And if you don't have a green grass device, an edge device, then, uh, then you can't do it. From what I can see, there's no plan to support other protocols. I mean, I'm not privy to all of AWS's uh, things, but I think MQTT seems to be winning and I know that whatever they build they have to build their own broker for so I would be surprised if anything was coming anytime soon on to Julian using a WS IoT stroke device pilot would it be easy to quickly see what updates were successful across a fleet of devices and also quickly be notified at what stage of an update a failure occurred on select devices um, yes uh, AWS IoT has the notion of this device maintenance, which allows you to execute jobs across the devices. Communicating via MQTT queues, you do, devices can feed back their progress uh, and they can feed back whatever you want. So frankly, you can feed back whole logs if you're doing a troublesome update or you're doing updates across test devices that you want a lot of information about. Uh, device pilot allows you to visualize the state of all of your devices across the whole of time. So as long as they successfully reported something, you'd be able to view that in a log. You'd be able to filter your devices by those that had historically had faults, even if later you actually did a successful update. So as long as at one point you communicated the information you need to know about the failure, uh, you should uh, get back uh get back to what you want so i've just been distracted because i've just been told that uh, it's uh time to end yes yeah, uh, i'm going to start taking questions here i'm happy to type a reply to uh Benigal's, uh thing 
but thanks yeah, very much indeed tom that was really really helpful um well as you can see we've got more questions than we have time to answer we're very very happy to answer questions at any point by uh, by email or even just in the chat window today um feel free to use us as a general resource for um advice and guidance on aws we're completely independent from 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 amazon device pilot works with any platform but uh, we do know a fair about a, a bit about it and we're, we're happy to help um, in terms of further reading, I can recommend, obviously, AWS's own documentation. Uh, there's also, interestingly, an open guide to all the AWS services, including IoT, uh, on GitHub. We've published a few broader white papers on, on things you might like to consider in IoT on our website. Something we haven't talked about today is testing. Obviously, if you're building uh, any kind of cloud framework for IoT, you will need to test it, and you'll need to test it at scale to prove it doesn't fall over. It's hard to do that using devices, even when you have enough devices. And so generally, the best approach is to actually create an estate of synthetic devices. We've developed an open source tool that we use for some of our own acceptance testing. Um, we published it, and you're very welcome to use it uh, and give us feedback. And finally, of course, we'd love you to become a device pilot user. You can sign up for free on our website. And if you are an AWS IoT user, it's particularly easy to use because you can uh, use it without writing a single line of code, just a few clicks, uh, and you're up and running. So thank you very much indeed for listening to this webinar from Device Pilot. We look forward to talking to you another day.